Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Richard Brubieskis, Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Yale Reproductive Ecology Laboratory and the YIBS Program in Reproductive Ecology. Professor Brubieskis's most notable research involves the evolutionary biology and endocrinology of human and comparative life histories, reproduction, aging, and metabolism. He is the author of Men, Evolutionary and Life History. Today we talk with Professor Brebieskis about the male species from a life history and evolutionary perspective and what it may hold for our future. Welcome Professor Brebieskis. Thank you Marilyn, thank you for having me. You have spent a good many years studying the human male species and have arrived at a new way of understanding them. While we're pretty much all familiar with evolutionary theory, it's the addition of the life history theory um, that you bring that um, provides a new approach. Tell us about it. Well, life history theory actually has a, a pretty long history. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually, I would say, a part of evolutionary theory and uh, in basic terms it's sort of looking at a species whether or not you're looking you're thinking of humans or fruit flies or whatever uh, in terms of specific events during the course of their life mm -hmm. uh, such as when they're born how long does it take for them to mature uh, when do they become uh, reproductively mature how long do they reproduce and then ultimately uh, when do they die okay um, and we know that a lot of the the timing of those events um, are the result of constraints. Uh, constraints on your time, constraints on energy in terms of how much food you can get from the environment. Um, and what we're finding right now is that life history theory can inform us um, uh, in pretty powerful ways in terms of how we, we actually understand uh, human biology. Okay, and what are some of the specific things you look at to do that? Uh, well, one of the ways uh, we do this, me and many of my colleagues, is to look at hormones. Mm -hmm. And what I tell my students is what, what is an anthropologist doing mucking around with, with hormones? Um, but it has to do with the fact that all of biology uh, is the result of the interaction between the environment and your genes. And hormones are a wonderful way of sort of looking at that interaction. Mm -hmm. They sort of, they're the liaison, if you will, of the, in, the information that comes from the environment. Uh, your hormones sort of sense um, is there a lot of food around? Is there a mate around? Uh, it's sort of it, your hormones sort of adjust accordingly, and then they go in and sort of tinker with your genes um, in hopefully an appropriate way for whatever the environment is, is, uh, is placing in front of you. Okay. And after all of this research that you've done, what can you tell us? Why are men the way they are? What are some of your conclusions? Well, um, men, um, in contrast to women, mm -hmm. um, have different constraints. They have different constraints in their life and um, those constraints are pretty common across mammals. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not really completely unique to humans. There are some unique things about humans. But um, a lot of the constraints that we see in humans are common in other animals, such as the fact that uh, metabolically, one of the biggest differences is that um, men or male mammals, period, don't invest a lot metabolically in reproduction. Mm -hmm. uh, men don't gestate, they don't lactate, uh, they don't menstruate, um, and so men don't have those metabolic costs that women have to deal with during the course of their life, and it really affects uh, everything from their behavior to their reproductive strategies to their immune system. Okay. Um, so those are some of, the, some of the key differences. Okay, and what are some of the things that may um, help us understand how we will be in the future? Well, what's interesting is if you understand the constraints that women are under compared mm -hmm. to men, uh, a lot of it has to do with um, child rearing. Mm -hmm. A lot of it has to do with how much time you have to spend uh, raising your children. And since um, men can do a lot of things, they can take care of children, they can do a lot of things, but they can't lactate, at least not under normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is I think in the future, uh, some of those constraints may be lifted on women as they become more economically and politically empowered. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, as we know, um, having uh, a male partner isn't even necessary to have a child. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what's interesting is how the, 
these these constraints that were common throughout our evolution um, in some instances aren't as relevant as they were in the past. I think there'll still be things that we'll have to deal with, mm -hmm. but it's interesting how um, I think women in particular don't aren't under the same constraints in many ways mm -hmm. as they were in the past. Do you think we'll we'll find any new kinds of constraints or difficulties moving forward with these changes? I think so. I think regardless of whether or not you have a biological constraint, there's always economic constraints. There's always constraints on your time. Mm -hmm. um, if you become more economically empowered, um, it comes at a cost. You have to spend more time at work. You invest mm -hmm. more time with your colleagues, building relationships, and that's time spent away from your family or your friends or, or whoever. Right. So there's always going to be trade-offs, which is one of the, to me one of the appeals of life history theory because the core of trade-offs um, applies even when you're outside of the forest, if you're outside of a, um, what you think, a natural environment, an in urban environment. Okay. Uh, you still have a lot of those constraints. And how does your theory apply to some contemporary health concerns like um, prostate cancer, for hmm. instance, or male contraception? Hmm. Uh, well, in terms of, we'll start with, with prostate cancer. Uh, there are costs and benefits mm -hmm. to being in an energy-rich environment like we do. So I can leave the studio and walk down the street and get a slice of pizza or have it delivered mm -hmm. and have lots of calories with virtually no, no effort. Um, and because I'm able to get those calories, uh, I can afford to have higher hormone levels like testosterone level. Testosterone uh, comes with a metabolic cost. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's higher, I can build more muscle if I wanted to, if I wanted to really hit the gym hard or something. Um, but at the same time, later on in life, those higher testosterone levels um, might contribute to a higher risk of prostate cancer since testosterone can increase your risk of prostate cancer, not at an individual level, but at a population level. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of things like a male contraceptive, I think it's interesting uh, to understand the motivation for men in terms of why they would want to take a male contraceptive. Mm -hmm. um, women take contraceptives because they want to regulate the costs and benefits of having children throughout their life. It's a good time, a bad time, uh, socially or economically, what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, for men, it's a little bit different since they don't bear a lot of those costs. They don't, again, they don't gestate, they don't lactate. Um, so the motivation for taking a male contraceptive may be a little bit different. Um, I think there may be more of a market, if you will, if uh, for men who actually have a lot of research, wealthy men, if you will, and uh, who may have more of an incentive to, I think, to sort of keep a closer eye, if you will, on their reproduction. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can you speculate on how the human male species will evolve down the road? What do you think we'll see? Oh, down the road, um, if uh, you really consider some of my colleagues, some of the wonderful research you're doing, I think uh, you're probably going to see a lot more investment mm -hmm. by uh, males and their offspring because I think part of female empowerment is the fact that men are going to have to negotiate with women more about reproduction. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that negotiation is going to involve investing more in children, sticking around, uh, help raising them, um, investing in them economically with their time, uh, their resources. So I think in the future, um, if we hopefully see more empowerment of women, I think you'll see men investing more in childcare. Uh, more than you do now, even though humans actually do invest a lot more in child care than most other primates. But yeah, I think it's probably on the uptick. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing some of your research. Thank you. For more information about Professor Bribieskis and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.